We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io. Consider the resume of one Mildred Babe Didrikson Zaharias. From out of the obscurity of a Texas oil town called Beaumont, Babe was scouted for the Employers Casualty Women's AAU basketball team based in Dallas. In 1930, her first year with the team, and in the two subsequent seasons thereafter, she's named All-American and is the best player on a championship-winning team. In 1932, she competes in the Amateur Athletic Union National Championship for track and field, which doubles as the tryouts for the USA Olympic team. She competes in eight events as a one-woman team and wins the entire meet for employer's casualty. At the 1932 Olympics, she competes in three events, the maximum allowed for women in the first Olympics to include them, and medals in all three, the now-defunct distance baseball throw, the high jump, and the javelin throw, the last of which she'd only tried for the first time about two years previous. After that, she launches into a golf career, that would span two decades and set a record for tournament wins that was surpassed only by Tiger Woods. She beats every female competitor amongst her peers, some of the legends of men's golf, and ultimately, for a while, even cancer. Oh yeah, and at some point, just for fun, she pitched in exhibition baseball games to the likes of Jimmy Fox and Joe DiMaggio. Already, there is little doubt that Babe Didrikson Zaharias is a goat. The only question remaining is... Without any qualifiers or asterisks, was Babe Didrikson Zaharias the greatest athlete of all time, bar none? My name is Oz Davis, and this is Truly the Goats, sports history as told through its superstars. In this episode of Truly the Goats, we're going to do things a little bit differently. We're going to tell the story of Babe Didrikson's Aarius with a pair of voices other than mine. Joining us as a guest is W.L. Pate, director of the Babe Didrikson's Aarius Museum and Beaumont Visitor Center. He's certainly among the very biggest, if not the biggest, authority on the Babe. We'll also let Babe's words speak for themselves with excerpts from her autobiography, This Life I Have Led. And if anything you're about to hear contradicts the historical record or vice versa, well, that's what happens with a legend. As Babe herself once put it, Now, you see, the stories about me sometimes get a little tall in the telling. Babe's autobiography begins with, You never saw anybody more excited than I was that night at the railroad station in Beaumont, Texas, back in February 1930. Here I was, just a little old high school girl, wanting to be a big athlete. And now, I was getting a chance to go with an insurance company in Dallas and play on their basketball team in the Women's National Championships. It was an overnight sleeper trip to Dallas about 275 miles from Beaumont. To me, that was like going to Europe. I'd never been more than a few miles away from my home in my life. Now, I bet I've traveled a couple million miles since then, competing all around the United States and in other parts of the world, but... That first trip was the start of everything. Even then, I had other ideas besides playing basketball. I wanted to be in the Olympic Games, and after that, I wanted to be a golf star. One thing sort of led to another. I got to be an Olympic champion and win all the most important women's golf tournaments, and do a lot of other things. It didn't all go along as smooth as that sounds. I wanted to spend my life in sports, but I had to make money too. And that isn't so easy for a woman athlete. 
Babe was born in 1911, and her family moved to Beaumont in 1915 or 16 thereabouts. Tell me, what was Beaumont, Texas like at that time? Well, uh, as you may recall, in uh, January 1901, the first oil gusher in the world happened in Beaumont, Texas. So Beaumont's uh, an oil town. It's a port city. Since we're in the middle of a uh, pine forest, it was obviously uh, big in lumber as well. But just like most turn-of-the-century cities, you know, we hadn't got to the point where everybody had an F-150, but uh, we had some very wealthy people in town that had some uh, exceptionally nice homes uh, that they built with the money they made becoming millionaires at 10 cents a barrel. So it was a, a community of, I would think probably around 1915, probably had maybe 15 or 20,000 people. And then the second boom was in 1927, they discovered more oil in the area. They grew up poor, interestingly enough, in the shadows of the Magnolia Refinery, which is Exxon Mobil now, which is literally about, oh, a mile and a half to two miles from the original uh, spindle top oil gusher. She, she grew up in the shadows of the Magnolia Refinery, uh, jumping hedges in the neighborhood to practice the hurdles. As a matter of fact, she, as you may recall, she got the neighbors to cut the hedges the same height so she could practice jumping over. Which takes it, would you mind cutting your hedges just a little uh, and let yours grow just a little, you know? But it does tell you what kind of uh, fascinating individual we've got here that was so competitive growing up that she wanted to do that. Colonel McCombs met us with his car at the station. He had one of the basketball girls with him, Leona Thaxton. She was a big guard. We drove to the company's offices in the interurban building. I remember that we went to room 327. That's where Colonel McCombs' department was. Practically all the basketball players worked there. I guess that was to make it easier to round them all up and take off when there was a basketball trip. I'd never seen so many large girls, large feet, and large hands. They were really husky. That was a gray era of women's athletics. Nowadays, the big sports for women are tennis, fancy diving, swimming, and golf. And those are the best sports for women. Some of the others are really too strenuous for girls. But back there in the 30s, they made a big thing out of sports like women's basketball. Colonel McCombs introduced me to all the girls. One of them, Lalia Warren, said, What position do you think you're going to play? So I got a little pepped up there, and I said, Well, what do you play? She said, I'm the star forward. And I said, Well, that's what I want to be. And that's how it worked out, too. One Saturday morning at the office early in summer 1930, he said to me, Babe, what are you going to do to occupy yourself now that the basketball season's over? I told him I wasn't doing anything much. He said, Well, how would you like to go out to Lakeside Park with me this afternoon and watch a track meet? Here I'd been thinking about the Olympic Games since 1928, and yet I never had seen a track meet. So I went out there with him, and we stood around watching. I saw this stick line on the ground, and I said, What's that? And Colonel McComb said, It's a javelin. You throw it like a spear. Boy, did I get excited. He went through the motions for me, and I picked it up, and I tried it. I got pretty good distance, but it was so heavy, it was a man's javelin, that I slapped my back with it as I threw it. And it raised a great big welt. Four times I slapped myself on exactly the same spot, and that welt was really big. Colonel McCombs took me around and explained some of the other events. He showed me the high jump and the hurdles and stuff like that. Those hurdles reminded me of all the hedge jumping I'd done back home. I liked the looks of that event better than almost anything else. By the time we left, Colonel McCombs was agreeing with me that it would be a good idea if employers' casualty had a women's track and field team so the girls would have some good athletics during the summer. I'm sure that's what he had in mind all along. 
Later, we all got together and started talking about this track team and how we were going to organize. One girl said, I'm going to throw the javelin. And another girl said, I'm going to throw the discus. Another girl thought she'd like to do the hurdles. When it came around to me, I said, Colonel, how many events are there in this track and field? He said, why, babe, I think there are about nine or ten. I said, well, I'm going to do all of them. Everybody nearly died laughing. I talk like that in those days, and some people thought I was just popping off, but I was serious. If you had to pick one single feat during Babe's athletic career as the most impressive, what would you go with? Well, probably when she went to the Amateur Athletic National Championship track and field in 1932, she represented employer's casualty. She had already played on their uh, basketball team where she had been named All-American three years in a row. In July of that year, they had the Amateur Athletic National track and field event, and uh, the colonel thought, you know, I'm in the business of promoting employers' casualty, and rather than send a team, I'm going to send a person to represent employers' casualty that's that good. So when she showed up, she was the one-person team, and when they called out the name of Babe Didrikson as the only representative of employers' casualty. It was one of those days in an athlete's life when you know you're just right. You feel you could fly. You're like a feather floating in the air. I wasn't worried about the fact that of the 10 individual events on the program, I was entered in eight, including a couple I'd hardly ever done before. The shot put and the discus throw. I was going to be in everything but the 50-yard and the 220-yard dashes. Mrs. Wood and I just did get there in time for the opening ceremonies. They announced each team over the loudspeaker, and then the girls on that team would run out on the track and get a hand. There were over 200 girls there. Some of those squads had 15 or more girls. The Illinois Women's Athletic Club had 22. Then it came time to announce my team. I spurted out there all alone, waving my arms, and you never heard such a roar. It brought out goosebumps all over me. I can feel them now, just thinking about it. Some of the events that afternoon were Olympic trials. Other were just the national AAU events, but they all counted in the team point scoring. So they were all important to me if I was going to bring back the national championship for employer's casualty. For two and a half hours, I was flying all over the place. I'd run a heat in the 80-meter hurdles, and then I'd take one of my high jumps. And then I'd go over to the broad jump and take a turn at that. Then they'd be calling me to throw the javelin or put the eight-pound shot. Five hours later, she had won the event by herself and had scored 30 points. And the next closest team, which was Illinois, had scored 22. In connection with the girl from Dallas, interest stories were still being written today while she and her femme teammates were on their way to California in the fast approaching Olympics. The stories, which are gracing many of the country's leading sports pages, tell of this Dallas maid as being a girl who had never worn the spike shoes of track and field until two years ago. Only 19 now, she was found in Houston by one Colonel M.J. McCombs in 1930 while she was playing on a basketball team. After hearing from McCombs that she had great possibilities both in basketball and track, Miss Didrikson went to Dallas. Under the colors of the Cyclone, she helped no little bit in bringing two national basketball titles to Texas and at the same time won places for herself on the mythical All-American basketball teams. Now she's won the track and field title of the AEU for the Cyclones, and indications are that she will win other laurels for herself and the USA in the games at Los Angeles. Homer Olson, Austin Statesman, July 19, 1932. So she walked away. You can imagine the uproar in track and field because this was also the first year in the Olympics where women could compete in track and field. So it was referred to, we would refer to it today as the Olympic trials, but back then it was just the Amateur Athletic Union National Track and Field event. Uh, but she walked away as, as a one person, for lack of a better analogy, and there's so many of them. You know, it's like when uh, the $6 million man, you know, you go, how did that happen? How did she do that? Because, I mean, there were so many events. I mean, 
first place in uh, the 80 yard hurdles, the javelin, the high jump. I mean, you can imagine. And she's winning first place. I mean, she's literally going from event to event to event and not just placing, but winning. And you go, holy mackerel, or whatever they would say back in 1932. This really is, as Grantland Rice pointed out after the Olympics, a wonder girl. If you happened over to Jersey City for the National AAU Women's Track Meet, you saw in action a girl competed from Dallas who has a good claim to the title the world's greatest all-around feminine athlete. Her name is Babe Didrikson. Grantlin Rice, July 27, 1931. And in 1932, that was the phrase that Grantlin Rice used for her after she won two of the three events in which she entered because they would only let her enter three events, even though she qualified for five, because she was a girl and they didn't want her dying or keeling <laughs> over after one of the events or she'd have won more medals in the Olympics, but she won a gold medal in the hurdles and the javelin. I was in the javelin throw that first day and it didn't get started until late afternoon. Shadows were coming up all over the stadium and it was turning pretty cool. We all got out there to warm up. The event started. They had a little flag stuck in the ground out there to show how far the Olympic record was. It was a German flag because a German girl had set the record. It was some distance short of my own world's record. For three hours, some 50,000 spectators had become dizzy with the 10th Olympiad swinging underway and five Olympic records fell with a crash. Just at this point, there was a sudden lull as a lithe, strong-looking girl with bobbed auburn hair stepped up with a javelin in her hand as the name of Mildred Babe Didrikson was announced, there was a sudden cheer. Dallas Wonder, known as a one-girl track team, was facing her first Olympic test. Mildred Babe Didrikson got a running start and sent the spinning javelin on its way. The big crowd broke into a roar the moment it struck and quivered in the green turf. The crowd knew a world's record had been shattered without waiting for any announcer. And it so happened on this first throw that Miss Didrikson had broken the old record by more than 11 feet, as the marker announced, 143 feet, 4 inches. Grandland Rice, July 31, 1932. For the high jump, she actually should have won three gold medals, but it was a, they called it a split silver gold. Yeah, Every they got her on a technicality. Season. Yeah, the, the Western roll, right. which is pretty much how everybody does it today, you know, and a technique that she had used all the way through. All of a sudden, they went, can you do that? And you go, we're at the Olympics. I got here doing this, and now you go, wait a minute, she's really good. I mean, I think it's fair to say that there were a lot of people, male and female, that resented the fact that there was a woman that could compete successfully on what had been a man's area. How famous was Babe Didrikson after the 32 Olympics, and how much did Grantland Rice further her career by writing about her, by taking her out on the golf course for the first time? Well, as you know, being a historian from the standpoint of sports writers, Grantland Rice was probably the most prolific, well-respected sports writer of that era. And at that point in time, you only had newspapers and radios. There wasn't any television. So people read the newspaper and they listened to the radio. And Grantland Rice, as we all know, was quite a wordsmith. He wrote the poem that ended, it's not whether you win or lose, but how you how play, you play the game. game. Yeah. Yeah. So when Grantland Rice wrote it, people read it. And so when he came out and referred to Babe Didrikson as Wonder Girl and started talking about how prolific she was in particular sports, it really is the gospel, for lack of a better term, in sports. If Grantland Rice said she is, she is. And she always was pretty quick-witted, so there was always plenty of ammunition, if you will, about which to write, because Babe was one of those people. When we landed at the airport in Dallas, the mayor and everybody was there to greet me. 
There were a lot of civic officials and the employer's casualty people, Homer R. Mitchell, Colonel McCombs, Mrs. Henry Wood. They'd brought Mama and Papa in for the welcome home celebration, too. They paraded me through the city. Babe Dittrickson was given a more spectacular welcome at Dallas Thursday than was ever shown any athlete we know of. Her plane was escorted into Love Field by several army planes, and half the town was waiting for her at the field. A specially decorated car drove her down the main drag for all the people to see and to cheer, and we'll bet the Babe felt mighty proud and happy. Her usual self, Babe wasn't a bit bashful or backward, and carried on like nobody's business. She told everyone about her golfing aspirations and talked of little else. When she alighted from the plane, her baggage consisted of three javelins and nothing else. She explained that she took a discus to Los Angeles, and when somebody swiped it, she returned the favor by eloping with three spheres and declared she was winner on the deal. Fact is, Babe seems to be the winner on most of all her deals. Austin American Statesman, August 12th, 1932. Well, after the Olympics and the post-Olympics and all that were over, I got back into the old office and basketball routine at Employer's Casualty. I was still liking it. But the pressure got pretty heavy on me during the fall of 1932. People kept telling me how I could get rich if I turned professional. That big money talk sounds pretty nice when you're just a kid whose family never had very much money. Now, what I really wanted to do at this point was to become a golfer. I was going to make an appearance at the Dallas ballpark, and they were going to present me an expensive watch. I went by the Cullum and Borum Sporting Goods store there in Dallas one day, and I saw this beautiful set of golf clubs in the window. It was like a girl seeing a mink coat. I was just dying to have those golf clubs, but I couldn't possibly afford to buy them. I went in and handled the clubs and everything. I know they'd have been glad to present me the golf clubs at the ballpark ceremony instead of the watch, which cost about just as much, but it might impair my amateur standing in golf if I accepted those clubs, so I took the watch instead. Early in December of 1932, my name and picture turned up in a newspaper ad with the statement that I liked the new 1933 Dodge automobile. The southern branch of the Amateur Athletic Union declared me a professional. Now, that would have been fair enough if I'd given my permission for my name to be used in that ad or taken pay for it, but I hadn't. A Dodge man in Dallas had set it up on his own. He didn't realize that it would cause any trouble. I'd already started another basketball season with the employer's casualty Golden Cyclones. This made me ineligible for that. And it meant I couldn't compete in the AAU track meets anymore either. Dan Ferris, secretary-treasurer of the National Amateur Athletic Union, announced tonight that Mildred Babe Didrickson, star all-around athlete from Texas, had disqualified herself from further amateur competition by permitting her name to be used for advertising a commercial product. Local newspaper Sunday printed advertisements by an automobile company in which Miss Didrickson was quoted as praising the performance of a new model. An action picture of the Texas girl clearing a hurdle accompanied the advertisement. Ferris said that this was in direct violation of AAU rules and automatically disqualified her from further amateur competition. He said he had wired the chairman of the AAU district in which Miss Didrickson is registered, pointing out the rules violation. AP Wire Report, December 5th, 1932. But by then, I decided to turn pro anyway. I started out by doing some work for the Chrysler Motor Company. Chrysler also got a fellow at the Ruthroff and Ryan Advertising Agency to act as my agent and arrange some bookings for me. He got me a contract to start out making stage appearances at the RKO circuit after the auto show was over. I had an 18-minute act. A performer named George Libby was working with me. He'd be up there on the stage to get things started. He'd play the piano and do an Eddie Cantor imitation. Then I'd come down the aisle wearing a real cute Panama hat and a green swagger coat and high-heeled spectators. The idea was that I was just back from Florida. We'd swap a few lines, and then I'd sing a song. After I got through singing, I'd sit down and take my high heels off and put on rubber-soled track shoes. Then I'd remove my coat. I was wearing a red, white, and blue jacket and shorts of silk satin. I'd demonstrate different kinds of athletics. One of the things I did was run on the treadmill. They staged it real nice with a black velvet backdrop and a great big clock to show how fast I was going. They had someone running beside me on another treadmill. At the end, they would forge my treadmill ahead a little bit. I'd break the tape and go on the wheel. 
surprised at how good a notice that show got the next day. Friday afternoon was the babe's first time behind footlights, and the girl from the Lone Star State took the hurdles gallantly as she ever did on the track. If her heart was thumping from the dread disease of stage fright, it wasn't apparent from the audience. After a bit of preliminary clowning by her partner, George Libby, who was rushed here from New York for the occasion, Babe sings a song over the mic and then goes into her equivalent of a dance. The Babe skims a hurdle, jumps a couple of times, drives imitation golf balls, and runs on a treadmill. Mr. Libby bemoans the fact that the limited scope of the stage forbids her from showing more of her extraordinary prowess, such as heaving the discus, flinging the javelin, or tossing a basketball. And Mildred ends her turn by playing a harmonica with no mean skill. Clark Roderbach, Chicago Tribune. Before the week was out, I was beginning to enjoy myself. I liked the feeling of that crowd out there. I had bookings after Chicago and Brooklyn and New York. Something at... 2500 a week? And yet, it was still in my craw that I wanted to be a champion golfer. I could see I'd never get to do that with all these four and five stage shows a day. I was spending all my time either in the theater or my hotel. And I didn't like having to put that grease paint on for every show. I talked it over with my sister Esther Nancy. We just called her Nancy, though. She said, Babe, honey, you can make a lot of money on this circuit. It's just a question of whether you want to do it. I said, Nancy, I don't want the money if I have to make it this way. I want to live my life outdoors. I want to play golf. I wanted to get into the golf a little bit because I think that ultimately mm-hmm. in the end, this is how she's most associated, having ultimately been the founder of the LPGA, being the first woman to play with the men on the on the PGA Tour and such. But again, this is another sport that she more or less learns from scratch after the Olympics. Literally. After she played, exactly. When Grantland Rice invited me out to the Brentwood course during the Olympics, I'd never played a round of golf in my life. Granny had three other sports riders with him, Paul Galico and Westbrook Pegler and Braven Dyer. Did it make me self-conscious to be with well-known people like that? Nah. It's never seemed to bother me whether the people I meet are famous or not. All I was worried about was how good they were as golfers. I didn't want to look like a fool on that golf course. Nah. While they were having some coffee before we teed off, I excused myself. I said I wanted to change my shoes and borrow some clubs. I ducked out to the pro shop and hunted up Owen Dutra, the Brentwood pro, who won the PGA Championship that year. I said, Mr. Dutra, I'm going to play golf with Granny Rice and Pegler and the boys. I want you to show me how it's supposed to be done, just so I won't look too bad out there. He lent me some clubs, and he showed me as much as he could in a few minutes about the grip and the stance and the swing. He demonstrated how you should pivot when you swing, and he kept telling me, look at the ball real hard. That's the most important thing. I said to Granny, I don't know how to play this game, so don't bet too much money. (laughs) He told me they were just going to play a dollar a hole. And what does the babe do? She steps up to the ball like Jean Saracen, bothers not about a practice swing, and then slugs the pellet far down the fairway. When we mere males reached our drives, we'd found that Miss Didrickson was 15 feet on down the fairway. Grantland Rice, August 8th, 1932. After that first drive, they couldn't believe I'd hardly ever swung a golf club before. They said, you must have played a lot of golf. Grantland Rice was playing pretty good golf, so he and I were ahead. As I remember, we were two up coming into the 16th hole. That was a short hole. There was a big dip down from the tee, And then the green was way up on top of a hill. When Paul Galico hit the best tee shot, it looked like he was a cinch to win the hole. So Granny whispered to me, Babe, why don't you challenge Paul to race you down and up that hill? Paul's a real good sport, and he took the dare. Of course I beat him, because I was in the peak of condition. But he raced me all the way. He was so winded, he had to lie down on the grass and catch his breath. When he finally got up, He four-putted the green. Granny and I won the hole and the match. Now, I'd thought about being a golfer before, but I think that was the day that really determined me on it. After she plays with House of David baseball for a little while and, you know, has a little fun with with the St. Louis Cardinals. And after she plays with House of David baseball for a little while and, you know, has a little fun with, with the St. Louis Cardinals and things like that. Another fellow I met early in my career was Babe Ruth. 
I made a point of being introduced to him because he was the original babe, you see. He seemed to take an interest in me, too. He said, Babe, let me give you some advice. I wish someone had told me this when I was your age. I know you're making money, but put some of it away. Get yourself an annuity. Um, well, she actually, and I know you'll bring this out, but she actually uh, uh, played in uh, a couple of exhibition, well, what we'd call spring training games, because they were all exhibition back then, spring training games, and one of those incidents, they wanted to make her a pitcher, because obviously if you had the record in throwing the baseball, you could throw it far and hard. In the spring of 1934, after the basketball season had ended, this promoter, Ray Doan, got me to appear with his House of David baseball team. All the players had beards. They booked games all over the country and drew some good crowds. Now, I was an extra attraction to help them draw the crowds. I was the only girl, and I didn't wear a beard. I didn't travel with the team or anything. I hardly even got to know the players. I had my own car, I had the schedule, and I'd get to whatever ballpark they were playing at in time for the next game. I'd pitch the first inning, and then I'd take off and not see them again until the next town. In Florida, before the baseball tour started, I did a little exhibition pitching against some of the major league and minor league teams. One day I was at Bradenton, Florida, where the St. Louis Cardinals were training. They were going to play an exhibition game with the Philadelphia Athletics. I was sitting in the grandstand before the game with Dizzy and Paul Dean of the Cardinals. Jimmy Fox was there, too. Dizzy Dean was always bragging, you know. That is, people call it bragging. Actually, it was just his way. It was Southern Texas talk. Dizzy was good, and he knew it. He'd say, I'm going to do something big, and then go ahead and do it. Well, we were talking there, and the fellows were kidding each other back and forth. There was a little rib steak going on. And Dizzy says to Jimmy Fox, We'll pitch Babe against you, and I'll bet you that me and Paul and Babe can beat you guys. So it wound up with me pitching the first inning for the Cardinals. Frankie Frisch was managing the team then, and he was a fellow to enjoy a stunt like that. They put Paul Dean out in left field because he was going to come in anyway and pitch after I finished. Pretty soon, the bases were loaded with none out. Those bases got loaded on hits, not walks. I always had pretty good control. I seldom walked anybody, but I couldn't seem to throw the ball past these major leaguers. The next batter hit a line drive, but it turned into a double play and nobody scored. That brought up Jimmy Fox. There was a big grove of orange trees out back of left field. I don't suppose many balls were hit that far, but with the girl pitching and Jimmy Fox batting, Paul Dean wasn't taking any chances. He was backed up almost to the edge of the orange grove. And Jimmy Fox hit a ball deep into those trees. Paul Dean turned and started running back. He disappeared right into the orange grove. A couple of moments later, he came trotting out. He was holding his glove for everyone to see. There was a baseball and about five oranges in it. That's how he made the third out. And that was enough pitching for me that day. I mean, that's just right out of Hollywood, only it's really true. So... While you've heard of young women that actually got to pitch bat in practice here a few years ago and acting like that was a big deal, she actually appeared and played in two game, a couple of games uh, in spring training. And as Karen Kunkel, who was part of the All American uh, Young Girls Baseball group on which the movie A League of Their Own was based, said, I, I saw Babe play. If they had to put her anywhere but pitcher, she could have played in the major leagues. She was that good. And then she took up golf. Golf was still my real objective. All I wanted to accomplish with these other things was to get in a financial position where I could concentrate on golf. That was my big sports love now. Bobby Jones came to Texas to play an exhibition at the Houston Country Club, and I traveled all the way from Dallas to see him. He'd turned professional since making his Grand Slam of the British and American Amateur and Open Tournaments in 1930. Oh, he was a great idol of mine. I sat down with Bobby at the Golf Writers' Dinner in New York not too long ago, and I asked him if he remembered playing that exhibition in Houston. He said, yes, I remember. We got rained out there. And that's what happened. He just got to play a couple of holes and the rain ended the round. Oh, it was such a disappointment to me. Even in the short time I got to watch him, though, I was impressed by the way he stepped up there on the tee and slugged the ball. He was out to hit the ball just as hard as he could. 
and that's always been my kind of golf. I saw that Bobby Jones exhibition a short time after my summer of baseball with the House of David. Seeing Jones sort of fired up my own golf ambitions, an employer's casualty helped to make it possible for me to get going on golf again. They not only gave me my job back one more time, they got me a membership at the Dallas Country Club and paid for my lessons there. I spent practically all my spare hours out there. In November of 1934, I decided to find out how much progress I was making by entering my first golf tournament, the Fort Worth Women's Invitation. I went out there for the qualifying round. Somebody asked me how I thought I'd do, and I said, I think I'll shoot a 77. I said things like that in those days. And I wasn't trying to be smart. It was just what was in my mind at the time. And that's the sort of thing that can make you famous if it comes true. And it came true that day. I played my 18 holes and my score was exactly 77. That made me the medalist for the tournament. The next best score was 82. It did me good to see the headlines in the Texas newspapers that day. May 14th, the bottom dropped out of everything. The United States Golf Association announced Tuesday it had advised the Southern Women's Golf Association to reject the entry of Mildred Babe Didrikson, Texas's all-around athlete, for the 1935 Southern Championship to be played at Louisville starting May 20th. Ever since Miss Didrikson won the Texas State Championship several weeks ago and announced her intention to seek the national title now held by Virginia Van and Wee, the Golf Association has been conducting an investigation into Miss Didrikson's activities as a professional baseball and basketball player. The decision was reached by the Amateur Status Committee of the USGA, of which A.M. Reed is chairman. After we considered all of the facts in the case, said Reed, we agreed the decision made was for the best interests of the game. Associated Press, May 14th, 1935. She says in her autobiography that, quote, they never did announce the reasons, unquote, for their decision. Do you have any ideas? Well, here's the story. Uh, after she had won, a lot of, if you can imagine, I mean, let's face it, in athletics, just like in life, there are people who are jealous. They're particularly jealous if somebody's really better than they are. And people can be really petty because, unfortunately, some people are poor losers, you know, the, and they really don't like it if the winner is somebody who steps out and says, I expect to win. And appreciate this is we're talking literally 25 years before Cassius Clay, a.k.a. Muhammad Ali later, who came out and said, I'm going to win. I'm going to knock, knock him out in the fourth and did it in a poem. Babe would literally walk in and say, Babe's here. Who's playing for second? And you can imagine these ladies that grew up around the country club playing golf would say, who is who does she think she is? And the answer is, uh, she's the winner of the tournament. And that just irritated the heck out of them because they did come in second or third or fourth. Uh, because the deal with the car, she didn't even get paid for. That was the bottom line. It'd been one thing. And to say somebody's a professional because somebody took a picture of her with a car and started promoting the car as though Babe uh, was advertising for them and called them a professional, you go, really? Come on, boys and girls. But that's how petty some people could be. So uh, it was no question. And Babe lost three years as an amateur there. And I think, as you'll recall, since you've read the book, she started doing some exhibitions uh, with Gene Sarazen so people could walk, go watch her play golf uh, because she was that good and hit the ball farther than most of the guys on the PGA Tour. Babe Didrikson is being persecuted, but she decided to cash in on her exploits as an amateur. Profiteer saw a standout drawing card lost. Maybe she was a bit loudmouthed during and after the Olympic Games, but what's wrong with that? It's a woman's prerogative to talk, and Babe had plenty to talk about. Sid Ziff, Los Angeles Evening Herald Express, May 1935. What I did back there in 1935 was to sign a contract with a sporting goods company, P. Goldsmith Sons. Later, they merged with McGregor Golf Company, and that became the brand name for their golf equipment. 
Goldsmith paid me a retainer of 2500 a year and brought out a line of women's golf clubs in my name, just as if I was already Bobby Jones or something. And I got booked for a series of exhibition matches with Gene Sarazen, who was the top man in the business at the time. I'd had several boyfriends as a youngster, but when I met George Zaharias at the 38 Los Angeles Open, I knew this was it. I still wasn't thinking about marriage when I entered the Los Angeles Open tournament in 1938. I was 23 then. The Los Angeles Open is one of the regular tournaments on the men's circuit, but there was no rule that said a woman couldn't play in it, so I got in there. I knew I wasn't going to beat the top men's pros, but I was still trying to establish myself as the greatest woman golfer. I wasn't the only one who didn't have any business being in the tournament. There were some fellows who were good part-time golfers, but not in a class with the real pros. One of the Los Angeles sports writers said, Babe, come on over here and meet your partners. I want our photographer to get a picture of the three of you. The only thing left that can happen to me now is to get hit on the head with a golf ball. I've just returned from the Los Angeles Open Golf Championship where I marched the fairways with the strangest, most bizarre threesome that ever played in a major tournament. Babe Didrickson, the girl with the He-Man complex, George Zaharias, the moving mountain of Pueblo who wrestles for a living, and C. Party Erdman, B-A-M-A-P-H-D, professor of religion at Occidental College. What an introduction George and I had. One minute we were saying hello and the next minute Photographers were crowding around and calling for him to put wrestling holds on me. He put his arm around me, pretending to apply neck holds and stuff. I didn't mind at all. We drove off the first tee. As I walked down the fairway, I kept looking back at George, and he seemed to sort of be watching me. George was 29 years old then. He was husky and black-haired and handsome. His parents were Greek. The sports writers called him the Crying Greek from Cripple Creek, which was a Colorado town, but George actually came from Pueblo in Colorado. A lot of great golf was played the first day of that 1938 Los Angeles Open, but practically all the gallery went with George Zaharias, Party Yardman, and myself. Those people didn't see too much good golf, and my mind didn't seem to be on my game. Zaharius, the boogeyman, did all right too for an amateur, if you can call it wrestler and amateur. He went out 40, although he spent most of his time out in the rough. If it had been wrestling, they would have disqualified him for unnecessary roughness. Babe had her troubles too. She took a 44, losing most of her strokes on the greens. I guess those short ones weren't just putty in her hands yesterday. The only person in the whole gallery who was certain of what was going on was Mrs. Edgar Richards. Now there was one woman who knows what the score is. She ought to. She was the scorekeeper. I guess religion still pays, because the professor finished with a 75, Zaharias finished with an 83, the babe finished with 84, and Mrs. Richards finished with writer's cramp. Jack Singer, Los Angeles Times, January 8, 1938. As I left, George called out, I'll be seeing you tomorrow. Less than a year later, we were married in St. Louis. How many more tournaments would babe have won in three years, uh, looking at how many she won between the time that she really started playing and when she passed away in 1956, because she was really only active through 1954. So you're you're talking about 15 years. So uh, if you think about it, from 1938 to 1954, you know, uh, it's how many years she pretty much competed in golf. And you go, well, let's see. Wow, she won 82 tournaments, 14 in a row, 17 out of 18. And you go, how many could she have won with three more years of golf? Because Tiger Woods just won his 82nd tournament. And he's pretty good. (laughs) 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 Tad Sam Snead. I, I said that with a straight face. But no, that's just it. I mean, if, if knowing how good Tiger Woods is, how good Sam Snead was, they won as many golf tournaments as they did. And there wasn't as many tournaments for women as there were for men. Byron Nelson won 13 PGA events in a row. Babe won 14 tournaments in a row. And interestingly enough, of the two guys that won the most tournaments in a row, 
Fire Nelson, and total Sam Sneed, they've actually beat them in the Phoenix 1945 Pro-Am uh, when she shot 67, Byron Nelson shot 69, and Sam Sneed shot 70. So now when you go historically speaking, what a day. Those three guys, those three individuals, Babe, 82 tournaments, 14 in a row, Byron Nelson, 13 tournaments in a row, and Sam Sneed, a total of 82 victories. Uh, how would you have liked to have been there at watching those guys play. We talked about the long winning streak, and shortly after this winning streak was snapped, she won the 1947 British Women's Amateur Championship. What's the importance of that? Well, I think when you, she was the first American to win that. And when she went over there, you know, there's a lot of match play tournaments, as you are well aware. It's not just total strokes. So there's a lot more uh, you know, it's one thing to go out and play in a tournament, stay focused, and know you don't have to beat uh, one person. You got to beat the field, and but so you kind of get in your zone. But when you're playing in match plays, and, and they they did a lot of that, so that it came down to the last day, and so here you're you're playing in a foreign country, and it's much colder, even in the summer. So people are wearing sweaters and playing the the wind. There's a whole lot more, uh, and it's a different game. As you can, when you look at the length courses in Great Britain compared to the Pinehurst, uh, Southern Hills, we could go around the United States and look. They're not made the same way. So you play literally a different game over there than you do over here. But she was so popular with the British people, you know, I mean, she and George are shown on a video doing the Highland Fling after she wins. The, you know, I mean, the people over there just adored Babe Zaharias because it was Zaharias by then, as you know. But you literally had to psych yourself up, knowing you're playing in a foreign country and you're no American had ever won this tournament before. And uh, I'm not sure how many years they had been playing it, but they had been playing it for decades and decades, and no American golfer had ever won it, and she won it. And because of her bigger-than-life personality, the people uh, in Great Britain, I mean, after all, the name of our country is Great Britain. Why wouldn't we embrace somebody who's great? I mean, you, you've read the stories and seen the film that they used to do because they didn't do videos back then and and could see how those people responded to babes of harriet's she's basically she goes from being america's first great women athlete celebrity to becoming the world's first great women's athlete celebrity Babe Dietrichson Zaharias hitched up her faded blue corduroy slacks after lunch today and slapped out a five and a four conquest of London's Jacqueline Gordon that made the Texas tomboy the first American born golfer ever to win the British women's crown. Commenting at Bree Burn Country Club yesterday on Babe Didrickson Zaharias' annexing of the British women's amateur title, Mrs. Glenna Collett Var Jr., many times United States national champion and twice runner-up in the British amateur tourney, stated, I wish to compliment her on her victory. There is no doubt that Mrs. Zaharias is the greatest woman golfer that ever lived. Associated Press reports, June 12, 1947. I must say that I've just completed the greatest thrill of my life, and that was going over to England and Scotland and win the British Amateur Championship. It has never been won by an American woman, and I'm the first one. I certainly had a great thrill playing. I got to get this in since you brought it up. How does this happen? I mean, this woman is the first woman golfer to play on the men's tour for the next 60 years. She's setting Olympic records that are never broken. She's doing the Thorpe thing, where some of her marks in the Olympics are taken 40, 50 years to beat. But she's coming out of, you know, a fairly small town, a poor family, Norwegian immigrants you know i don't know norway isn't particularly known for its spectacular athletes how does this happen is it just like t 
total outlier, or what's the secret? Texas is a unique state, and I'm, I'm telling you, I've been so fortunate. I have lived in other states. I've gone off to college in another state, played collegiate sports. I've been in the military 40-plus states, foreign countries, few places. But Texas is such a unique state. Uh, and it takes a lot of pride in the individualism of people on their own. So you, you're in a state where people take individualism pretty seriously of, hey, we can do that. We can do that. You go a little farther back in history, you get Davy Crockett, Jim Bowie, Colonel Fannin, Colonel Travis, Sam Houston. You go, man, that's a take this from Mexico, we'll start our own country. And from 1836 to 1845, the Republic of Texas was a foreign country. It was its own country. It signed a treaty with the United States to become part of it. Not, It wasn't annexed like territory. So the history of the state of Texas is, is one of individualism, of being as good as you can be and that the only person holding you back is the person you're looking at when you comb your hair. And that's the attitude that a whole lot of Texans have. And if you look back and see some of the ones that over the years have reached heights, you go, where's that come from? And I think it's just kind of a state of mind that you can accomplish what your goals are. You just decide what they're going to be and go after. And so I think that was sort of, and plus you grew up in a pretty sizable family. It wasn't like she was an only child. And there were a whole bunch of boys that she uh, had the opportunity with which to compete. And she just was such a competitor. She was unique. There's no denying that, that's for sure. As a professional in 1948, I found that there were a few more tournaments open to me than when I'd first played back as a pro in the 1930s. I even tried to enter the Men's National Open, but the United States Golf Association wouldn't let me. They issued a statement. As the championship has always been intended to be for men, the eligibility rules have been rephrased to confirm that condition. Thus, the USGA has declined an informal entry submitted in behalf of Mrs. George Saharius. I don't suppose I'd have finished around the top if they'd let me in there, but I don't think I'd have been at the bottom either. I wouldn't have disgraced myself, that's for sure. In 1948, I did get to play and win both women's divisions at Tarno Shanter. I also won the National Women's Open. But all this while something else was happening. It started in 1948. Coming home on a plane, I suddenly had this terrific pain in my left side. There was just a big swelling there. Then the pain stopped after a while and the swelling went down. It went on like that for several years. The pain and the swelling would come and then it would go. I'd say to myself, I should see a doctor about this, but I'm too busy right now. I'll have to put it off for a while. A little rest always seemed to fix me right up. A good hot bath, a good night's sleep, and... I'd be ready to go again. I kept on playing, and I did my share of winning. In 1949, I was first again in my prize money. The total only came to 4,300. Our ladies' PGA was just getting underway. My tournament victories included the Tarno Shanter World Championship and the Eastern Women's Open. In 1950, I had a real good year. I won just about all the top tournaments, both the All-American and the world at Tarno Shanter, the National Women's Open at Wichita, the women's title holders in Augusta, and the Western Women's Open at Denver. I was on top in money winnings again, this time with $13,550. In 1951, I scored another double at Tarno Shanter, which helped put me at the head of the money list once more. The total this time was $15,087. I started off as if I was going to have the same sort of year in 1952. I was up around the top in every tournament I played. Again, I was the leading women's money winner as we came to the end of April. But now that trouble in my left side was really getting to me. The pain and the swelling came more often, and I couldn't seem to shake off the attacks as fast as I had before. 
we moved up the west coast for the third leg of the weather vane at Seattle. This was in May. Well, those 36 holes were just agony for me. I finished 11th, which was the worst I'd ever done in a metal play tournament. George urged me to drop out after the first 18 holes, but somehow I got around the course the last day, and I was really dragging. I hoped that the rest would straighten me out again, but after a day or two, I gave up. The pain was so bad now, I couldn't stand it any longer. I told George, I think I'd better go to a hospital, and he said, I think so too. Well, what I'd had all this time was ephemeral hernia. Dr. Tatum told me that if I'd let it go another week, I might have been a goner. Now, the operation came off fine. I went back to our home in Tampa and began picking up right away. It would be a while before my operation mended enough for me to go back to the golf tournaments, but I chipped and putted a little. I did get to Tarn O'Shanter in time to enter the world. They'd taken to calling this tournament the Babes of Harry's Benefit because I'd won it all the four times it had been held. Well, for a while there in 1952, it seemed that I might make it five in a row. I'd had a pretty good round the first day, and also the second day. Then I began to tire. I did all right the third day on the outgoing nine holes, but tailed off coming back. The fourth day again, it was the same. I had a good chance to win after nine holes. Then I ran out of gas again and wound up third. Back home in Tampa, I practiced some more and kept feeling better. The Texas Women's Open that October was being held at the Rivercrest Country Club in Fort Worth. It's a short course. Rivercrest was where my record streak of 17 straight tournaments got broken back in the fall of 1947. That course had whipped me just about every time I'd competed there. I said to George, I'm going to go down and beat that golf course. So I went there about a week ahead in practice. I did whip the course and I won the tournament. It felt wonderful. Babes Air has held her fifth Texas Women's Open Golf Championship today by virtue of a 7-6 win over amateur Polly Riley. Mrs. Air is a professional playing out of Tampa, Florida, won the 17th annual tournament Saturday at Rivercrest Country Club by getting out in front on the first nine and staying there. It was a welcome victory for Babe over Miss Riley, a Fort Worth amateur, who had won this tournament at the expense of Mrs. Zaharias, 10-9, in 1948. United Press reports, October 27th, 1952. Then I came back to Tampa, and before long, I wasn't feeling wonderful anymore. November and December are the months when the tournament circuit closes down, and you figure on taking it easy and getting your pet back. But it wasn't working that way for me this time. Mostly the thing was that I seemed to be tired all the time. When I played a round of golf, I never felt like I wanted to play another nine holes, which I generally did in the past. In January, I came back as usual for the 1953 tournament circuit. I wasn't winning much of anything. Half the time, I wasn't even finishing the first five. I'd shoot a good round or a good nine holes, and then I'd tire. On March 9th in Florida, I placed second to Patty Berg in the Jacksonville Women's Open. The next week, I dropped down to sixth place in the women's title holders. I was just feeling worse and worse. George was getting more and more worried. He was with me the week after that during the Peach Blossom Betsy Rawls tournament in Spartanburg, South Carolina. I just about made it through the last 18 holes and finished completely out of the running. George made a doctor's appointment for me right then and there in Spartanburg. I talked him out of it. I'll be all right once I get a good night's sleep, I said. In another couple of weeks, the tour will hit Beaumont. I was really determined to make a good show in there because this was my hometown and the tournament had been created in honor of me, the Babes of Harry's Open. Now, I'll never know where I got the energy to play that tournament. It was three rounds of metal play instead of the regular four rounds, which was a good thing for me. I doubt that I could have played a fourth that day. The first two days, I put together about the best pair of rounds I'd shot on the whole winter tour. I took the lead with 142 strokes under par, and I practically exhausted myself doing it. The last day, it was more of an effort to play than ever. I wasn't in command of my shots the way I'd been the first two rounds. I lost three strokes to par on the outgoing nine. By the time we'd reached the 16th, I was four strokes over. Then I was able to birdie the 16th and get one of those strokes back. I saw my buddy, Betty Dodd, standing there when I came off the 16th green. I asked her, how do I stand with the field? Some golfers don't like to be told, but I always feel that I play better when I know what I have to do. Betty told me, all you've got to do is to get two pars to win. 
Well, I missed my par on the 17th hole. I knocked the ball up on the green about 12 feet from the cup. And then I went and three-putted. I hit my first putt about four feet beyond the hole and missed again coming back. Now I needed a par on the 18th to tie for first place or a birdie to win. The 18th was a par four hole. I felt as though I was crawling on my hands and knees by now. I got up there on the tee and pulled myself together and slugged the ball with all my might. And I hooked it over behind a tree. One more bad shot and I was going to blow this tournament. But I managed to come up with one more good shot. I took an iron and carried that ball onto the green about six feet from the pin. Then I knocked in my putt for the birdie I needed to win. That hometown gallery went wild. Betty Dodd and Patty Berg and some of the other girls rushed onto the green and lifted me up into the air. They practically carried me off to the clubhouse. Television cameras were going and everything. I should have been in a mood for celebrating, but I wasn't. As soon as I could get away, I went right up to my room and stretched out on the bed. I'd never felt so completely played out. This was on a Sunday night. On Monday morning, I had that appointment with Dr. Tatum. He had me get up on the examination table. He checked on the operation I'd had the year before and said, Well, everything seems to be all right. Then he probed around some more. I could see his face out of the corner of my eye. All of a sudden, he just turned white. He didn't say a word. I guess I'd suspected all along what my trouble was. I said to him, I've got cancer, haven't I? In uh, April 1953, Babe was operated on for cancer, and within four months, she was competing in another tournament, another golf tournament. Where do you put this among the athletic feats of the 20th century? And, and they told her, Babe, you're not going to play golf anymore. I mean, you can't play golf anymore. And of course, obviously, they forgot who they, with whom they were speaking, and she thought about it. She said, I can't play golf. You know, I mean, this was a big deal. I mean, you know, that kind of surgery in that era, you can imagine. And so basically, she's going to pretty much spend the rest of her life with a, a colostomy bag. And so she set those golf clubs in the corner, and literally, she just asked God, she said, please let me play golf again. One of those early days, I got out of my bed myself and walked over to the golf clubs. I picked out a four-wood and took my grip on it, and it felt real good. And so, literally, she focused on what do I have to do to get back on the golf course. So, here we fast forward. Within a few months, she's out hitting golf balls and playing and trying to compete. In January of 1954, I was back on the tour. I started out by placing seventh in the Tampa Women's Open. Then, at St. Petersburg, I tied for first place with Beverly Hansen. We had a sudden death playoff, and she outlasted me. She won it on the third extra hole. So the tour moved on to Miami Beach on February for the Serbia Women's Open. At this point, ten months had gone by since my operation. People were beginning to ask each other whether I'd ever be capable of winning tournaments again. And I was asking myself the same thing. I found myself battling for first place right down to the wire with Patty Berg. We both were two strokes under for the first three rounds. On the outgoing nine holes the last day, we both hit par on the nose. I began tiring again on the back nine, but for every hole where I slipped over par, there was another where I made it up with a birdie. I came up to the last tee even with par for that day and needed one more par to beat out Patty Berg. Whew, the last hole was a long one. A par five. And I hit my drive all the way over in the palm trees. I was in a real tough spot. There were palm leaves hanging down almost to the ground in front of me, and then there was a trap beyond them. I saw I'd have to hit the ball right into those palm leaves if I was going to carry over the trap and get some distance. I took a four iron and swung, and that shot came off exactly as I planned. It busted a hole right through the palm leaves and carried to within a nine iron of the green. It landed on a sandy part of the fairway, then I played a three-quarter shot with my nine iron. I've never studied a shot more carefully and blasted the ball onto the green. I got down in two putts, all right to make my par and win my first tournament since the cancer operation. And that was just about my biggest thrill in sports. The second greatest achievement, I think, behind the AAU Nationals is Babe comp competing a year later, 
in the Women's U.S. Open at Salem, Massachusetts in 1954, where she won the event by 12 shots, playing with a colostomy bag. Now, I'm a I'm a big fan of, of I'm a baseball fan. I remember when Kurt Schilling, when he uh, had his ankle was bleeding, you know, and he was still out there pitching. Uh, we remember, I mean, we flash back to Peyton Manning winning uh, the Super Bowl when he was hobbling, doing the best he can, what he could do to score enough points to win the Super Bowl, and he did. Or Carrie Strug, who nailed the perfect 10 after breaking her leg. Oh, oh, oh absolutely. And, and, and it ranks right up with all of those things of people that do extraordinary achievements when the chips are down. And many people would have folded and had a reason to say, I could have, but I didn't. And here's the reason. You know, I just had cancer surgery last year. <laughs> I mean, when you say that out loud, oh, yeah. Well, what were you doing this time last year? Oh, I had colon cancer surgery. Oh, what's that thing that we can barely tell? What the, oh, that's a colostomy bag. People wouldn't even go out in public with those things. She's competing with the U.S. Open for women, the biggest event for women on the planet Earth. The ever-astonishing Babe Zaharias, told 15 months ago she might never play again, climaxed one of the most stirring comebacks in sports today when she won her third Women's National Open Golf Championship by 12 strokes. Front-running all the way, but tiring at the end of the final day's 36-hole grind, the tall, sinewy daughter of Texas finished with rounds of 73 and 75 for a total score of 291. None other in the fancy feminine field came close to cracking 300 for the three days over the exhausting 6,393-yard Salem Country Club course. It was the Babes tournament from the moment she posted an even par 72 on opening day until she hacked out of the woods on the final hole, threw her hat high in the air, and exclaimed, quote, Thank goodness it's over. I couldn't have gone another hole, but it's the answer to my prayers. Unquote. Associated Press reports, July 3rd, 1954. And she wins it by 12 shots. You know, it wasn't the Catherine Hepburn missing the putt and uh, Pat and Mike with Spencer Tracy. This was, I won by 12 shots. And in golf, that's lapping the field. And you're thinking, holy mackerel. Anybody else that wasn't a true champion wouldn't even be out there trying to compete. You know, like Ben Hogan coming back from that traffic, uh, from that accident. Though sports fans across the world had been cheered by the story of Babe's great comeback, her future in golf was limited. The Tampa Women's Open in January 1955 would be the last tournament she would win. At the end of July 1955, I got some bad news. They spotted a trace of the new cancer on the right side of my sacrum, which is the rear part of the pelvis. So x-ray treatments were started. The doctor said it would be a three to six months before I could get back to the golf tournaments. And just as in 1953, a lot of people were doubting that I would ever get back in competition. As far as I was concerned, there was no doubt about my coming back again. With the love and support of my many friends I have made, how could I miss? They have helped me hurdle one obstacle after another, and any success I have had is due to a great extent to their devotion and consideration. Right now, I want to thank them one and all, as well as the many unknown people who have befriended me and helped me along the way. Winning has always meant much to me, but winning friends has meant the most. In the future, maybe I'll have to limit myself to just a few of the most important tournaments each year, but... I expect to be shooting for championships for a good many years to come. My autobiography isn't finished yet. Mildred L. Babe Didrikson Zaharias succumbed to colon cancer on September 27, 1956. She was 45 years old.
What kind of reactions do you get from people, especially young people, when they're hearing these stories about Babe Didrikson for the first time? Well, this year was the first year they had the Aurora Games in New York, which was a six-event sport sporting event, all female, all women sports, uh, held in Albany, New York, at the Times Union Center. The world against the Americas. Jackie Joyner Kersey, one of the world's greatest track stars, was the captain for the Americas. Nadia Comaneci was the captain of the world. Six events, uh, basketball, figure skating, tennis, beach volleyball. And I had the opportunity there because they were vying for the Babe Didrikson Zaharias Trophy. Jerry Solomon put it together, and Nancy Kerrigan, the Olympic skater, world champion, is Jerry Solomon's wife. And so he's promoting this and event, which will be back. It'll be every other year between the Olympics. And so I had the opportunity to talk to some of the women that were participating in this event, their coach said, W.L., come over here and tell us about Babe Zaharias. I mean, we've heard heard the name, and you can tell when people are tuned in and listening. And when I started talking about Babe Zaharias to these young women, and they're just in awe, they said, she did all those things? And I would tell them the same thing I told you. I said, and she's not my grandmother. So I'm not making any of this stuff up. And I'm not exaggerating. I'm telling you that Babe Zaharias was so good at so many things that, and then when she took up golf, she just rewrote the records. And and, uh, Nancy Kerrigan, she goes, wow. You know, Nancy Kerrigan was one of those uh, elite world champion skaters that everybody knew. To visit with somebody who's who's a world champion athlete like Nadia Comaneci, Shannon Miller, Donna De Verona, uh, Nancy Kerrigan, and all of these world-class athletes, all of whom are just go, that's amazing. There's only been three presidents or chairman of the Babe Didricks and Zaharias Foundation, Ben Rogers, my dad, and me. I've been doing it since my dad passed away in 2002. And people would ask, well, why do you do it? I said, are you kidding? This is the world's greatest female athlete. She grew up right here in Beaumont, Texas. I know what what it takes to be good in a couple of sports. I had a tryout with the St. Louis Cardinals play professional baseball coming out of high school. But I also had a football scholarship to play quarterback at Louisiana Tech. So I was a pretty decent athlete. So I know what you got to do to be pretty good in a couple of sports. But when you're exceptional in all of them, you got to stop, step back, and salute them and go, wow, that's amazing. And so every day I get up, I'm trying to figure out how to promote Babe Zaharias. As a matter of fact, in 1953, the Babe that Harriet's Open was played in Beaumont at the Beaumont Country Club, and it was played here until 1967. In June of 2020, the Babes of Harriet's Foundation is sponsoring with the WAPT, the Women's All Pro Tour. We're going to have the Babes of Harriet's Open again. That's fantastic. That's great news. Yeah, I'm a grown man that's done a lot of stuff. I get goosebumps just talking about it. I did mention I was an Army colonel. Didn't I? Most Army colonels don't get goosebumps, for, particularly when they're not talking about some war story. One last question. Was Babe Didrikson Zaharias the GOAT? The world's greatest female athlete is Babe Didrikson Zaharias. I have no idea who number two may be. Early on in her autobiography, on the third or fourth page, Babe declares, Before I was even into my teens, I knew exactly what I wanted to be when I grew up. My goal was to be the greatest athlete that ever lived. Now, just consider the audacity behind that statement. 
and consider how amazing it is that Babe Didrikson Zaharias, by any standard, is even in the running to be known as humanity's true all-time greatest. This has been Truly the Goats, an inclusive media production. We'd like to thank our guest, W.L. Pate, president of the Babe Didrikson Zaharias Museum and Babe Didrikson Zaharias Foundation Board President. For more on the museum and foundation, visit babedidricksonzaharias.org. Babe Didrikson Zaharias' autobiography, This Life That I Have Led, is in the public domain and may be downloaded for free at trulythegoats.com slash babe bio. Narration of This Life I Have Led in this episode was by Rachel Wong. Extra material, show notes, blog posts, and other related stuff on the greatest of all time are available on our website at trulythegoats.com. On Facebook and Twitter, find us at Truly the Goats. For more inclusive medium podcasts and video productions, visit us at inclusivemedium.com. I'm Oz Davis, thanking you for listening to Truly the Goats. The Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One Gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876 including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com R-O-W number one for access to the full Row 1 catalog and for gallery prints and gift items plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row 1 Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes.